It's 7 p.m. Thursday, July 4th, here in Seoul. And these are the top stories at this hour. Japan's controversial export curbs on chip material supplies to South Korea take effect. Seoul's presidential office calls the move a case of political retaliation that is in clear violation of international laws. The trade ministry and Korea's top IT giant, meanwhile, get busy discussing possible countermeasures. Japanese media outlets also criticize Tokyo's move, saying it will not only hurt Korean companies but also Japanese firms. North Korea reportedly picks its former ambassador to Vietnam, Kim Myung-gil, to serve as the North's counterpart to America's top nuclear envoy, Stephen Began. And there's only about a week to go until the FINA World Swimming Championships splashes down in Gwangju. We take a look at what to expect. New Center begins now. And welcome to Arirang News Center, coming to you live from Seoul. I'm Han Daen. And I'm Noah Ram. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Our top story this evening, the National Security Council says Japan's export curb on high-tech materials, which took effect today to South Korea, is a clear violation of international trade laws. Chaired by National Security Advisor Chung Woo-yong, NSC members concluded that Japan's move had quote, vengeful intentions and violates WTO norms. The NSC also decided to explore all diplomatic options to make Tokyo back down, which includes filing a complaint to the WTO. Japan recently announced new curbs on the export of key materials to South Korea used to make semiconductors and display. On the topic of regional security, NSC members agreed that the recent meeting between the leaders of the two Koreas and the U.S. was a, quote, historic event. They said it marked the start of a new era of peace and agreed to continue efforts for more Pyongyang-Washington dialogue and the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And staying with Japan's enforcement of new export restrictions on high-tech materials to South Korea, while the export curbs took effect as of today, South Korea's trade ministry has echoed the Blue House, saying Japan is violating global agreements. Our Ko Dyun hee has this report. Korea's trade ministry held a meeting on Thursday to discuss possible countermeasures to Tokyo's export restrictions on high-tech materials used to make semiconductors and displays. The attendees included trade minister Yu myung and business representatives from the chip and display industries. Minister Yu said Japan's actions are in violation of the Watson Arrangement, which covers the export of technologies that could have military applications. The Wasana arrangement is not designed to impede bona fide civil transactions, nor should it be directed against any state or group of states. However, Japan's recent move is only targeting Korea, limiting transactions between two countries' private companies with good intentions. Therefore, it is violating the arrangement. The government again raised norms related to the WTO. Minister Yu referred to Article 11 of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which led to the creation of the WTO, which bans prohibitions or restrictions on export volumes. She also vowed to announce measures to diversify import sources of core materials, parts and equipment soon. <coughs> Earlier in the day, Korea's finance minister Hong nam -ki also criticized Japan's new trade restrictions, calling them a clear act of economic retaliation. In an interview Thursday with CBS Radio, Hong said the government will take countermeasures if Japan doesn't back down. Their restrictions, he said, will not only hurt the Korean economy but also Japan's. As for filing a complaint at the World Trade Organization, Hong said the government will decide when to file the complaint after an internal review, but noted that it will be a lengthy process. Kuruni, Arirang News. South Korean government ministries are not the only ones criticizing Japan's move. Japanese news outlets have also slammed Tokyo's decision to restrict exports on Seoul as the move is expected to affect Japanese companies as well. Our Yoon Jung-min has more on that. 
Japanese news outlets have criticized Tokyo's export restrictions on South Korea, which affect shipments of high-tech materials used in chips and displays, saying the move will also harm Japanese industry. The Yomiuri Shinbun said on Wednesday that Japanese companies have expressed concerns that the export restrictions would undermine economic ties between Seoul and Tokyo, as well as hurting Japan. It said both countries are maintaining horizontal trade by supplying materials to each other, pointing out that the restrictions on South Korea would also negatively affect the material supply chains of Japanese companies. It went on to say that Korean companies are major buyers of those materials produced in Japan. Japan's right-wing Sankei Shinbun also pointed out that excluding Seoul from the export restriction whitelist will have repercussions for Japanese firms. Korea analyst at the Japan Research Institute Hidehiko Mukoyama said in the newspaper that 80% of Korean semiconductor exports go to China and Hong Kong, and Japanese companies in China will be affected. Mukoyama added in an interview with the Nihon Keizai Shinbun that restoring trust between the two countries is crucial to stave off the worst-case scenario. Yoon Jung-min, Arirang News. What started off as historical frictions have now escalated into trade tensions between Seoul and Tokyo. Let's now get the perspectives of a foreign expert on this issue. And for that, we have Dr. Helmut Wagner, the chair in macroeconomics at the University of Hagen, joining us through Skype. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Wagner. Thank you very much for being here. So with the trade restrictions kicking in today, how much damage is expected for Korea, considering that Korea is an export-oriented economy that relies heavily on semiconductors and tech goods? Yeah, in the short term, I think the direct effects on some tech companies such as Samsung will be very high and substantial. But for the whole economy in Korea, I think it will not be so substantial. Uh, the Japanese trade action is not to compare with an export ban. It only means that Japan will implement or increase bureaucratic uh, measures, export hindrances to some sensitive products. And this will increase, of course, costs and uncertainty for companies such as Samsung or LG Electronics. Uh, but, you know, the real danger comes from potential retaliation and counter-retaliation measures. This could end up in a trade war, but also in an increase in political aversions. And the most important thing, I think, is it will uh, lead to a stop in the uh, clumsy Asian integration process, economic integration process, which is very necessary for Asia, I think. Now, the South Korean government strongly argues that Tokyo's trade curbs are a clear violation of international laws, including the principle of WTO. If Korea takes the case to the WTO, how do you expect the process to go? I'm sure, uh, as you say, that Korea will take the issue to the WTO. But I think it will take a while to get a decision there. And I'm afraid that the process will worsen in this meantime. Therefore, I hope very much that both countries will get together and find a solution on a diplomatic way. Because retaliation measures will end up, of course, in a disaster and oh, WTO decision will not very much impress Japan, I think. Now, how can that Korea fight off the negative impact of the restrictions? What are some possible ways for South Korean firms to turn the crisis, perhaps, into an opportunity? Besides of trying to find a solution on the di diplomatic way and to wait for a WTO decision, uh, Korea can try to find some substitutes. It will not be easy, but the substitutes can be materials, other materials, or it can be other allies, other partners, which maybe export the same or similar products. And I'm sure and confident that Chinese, uh, that Korean companies will find some solutions. 
And therefore, I'm not quite sure that this uh, Korea can do more because doing some retaliation measures will just worsen the situation at the moment. I'm not sure whether this is the right step. Now, one last question for you. What do you make of this growing trend of tariff threats and export restrictions in the global economy? Yeah, okay. First, let me say, uh, I forgot to say that um, there is a chance uh, Japan, uh, against Japan, Korean companies could end up in the in the last step to find some solution by increasing their productivity. They are forced to now to really to innovate faster than before. And with respect to your question of growing global trend of tariff threats and export restrictions, this global trend is really frightening. But also the new trend of uh, countries like the United States to fight fiercely against countries which are the new competitors like China or an original way Japan now being afraid of Korea being a real competitor after Japan having been the real regional leader for such a long time. That's frightening that in this uh, kind of uh, situation in a Tokiditas trap way as Americans say that uh, these countries uh, take measures which are very bad for for the world situation and therefore I think uh, all uh, countries should be very soft in their reactions at the moment because the situation can easily go out of the line and therefore in principle it's an urgent need particularly in Japan and Korea and in Asia as a whole to intensify the discussions about Asian economic integration, which have been so slow for, for the whole time. And these, this always ends up in such conflicts. In Europe, you find some ways after this European economic integration process to find a solution always. We have the same problems with Germany and Greece and Germany and Poland and things like that, which you have uh, with Japan. But we find solutions because we have a basis on the basis of this European integration process. But that's just the main thing I think Japan and Korea have to to start to enforce. And I'm frightened that retaliation and counter-retaliation will stop this process at all. And this will be a disaster for both countries, I'm afraid. All right, Dr. Helmut Wagner joining us through Skype from Germany tonight. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for inviting me. President Moon Jae-in met this afternoon at the Blue House with one of Japan's top billionaire businessmen, the CEO of the conglomerate SoftBank. That's Son jung ui who is of Korean descent and is also known as Masayoshi Son. According to the Blue House, they discussed ways to foster innovative growth in the fast-changing era of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. President Moon reportedly got Son's advice about what South Korea needs to focus on to lead the Fourth Industrial Revolution and to speed up the secondary venture boom. To that, Son suggested that Korea focus on fully supporting the field of artificial intelligence. Moon then asked asked Son to help support professionals in AI, to which Son answered, reportedly with enthusiasm, that he would. It was rather unusual for Moon to meet one-on-one -on -one with a business figure, but despite the trade tensions between Seoul and Tokyo, the Blue House says neither Son nor the president mentioned the issue at all. It would appear that North Korea's new negotiating team for the nuclear talks is coming together. Reports say Pyongyang has notified Washington of its new chief nuclear envoy. Kim Ji-an reports. 
Media reports say North Korea has picked its former ambassador to Vietnam, Kim Myung-gil, as its new chief nuclear envoy, who will be the counterpart of the U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Stephen Began. The reports say Kim Myung-gil is replacing the North Special Representative for U.S. Affairs, Kim yok tol who led working-level negotiations in February and was reportedly executed in March in a purge after the Hanoi summit resulted in a deadlock. In an interview Wednesday with Radio Free Asia, senior foreign leadership analyst Ken Goss with the Washington-based CNA Analysis and Solutions said Kim myung gil would be the right person to lead the new talks given his experience and rank. Kim myung gil was formerly deputy chief of North Korea's mission to the United Nations in New York and has participated in the six-party denuclearization talks. Most recently, he served as ambassador to Vietnam for three years and eight months, including when the Hanoi summit was held in February. Kim myung gil returned to Pyongyang in April after finishing his term. There had been speculation that first vice foreign minister Choi Son-hee might serve as Began's counterpart, but Goss said that's unlikely considering that she outranks Began. Instead, Che will likely wield her influence behind the scenes tasked with coming up with strategies for the talks. Based on this, the experts said it seems the North has reorganized its negotiating team around Che's foreign ministry, rather than the United Front Department, the agency that handles inter-Korean affairs and had led the U.S. talks before. Citing a diplomatic source, multiple media outlets in South Korea report that Pyongyang may have informed Washington about its new working-level team last Sunday, the day of their leader's landmark encounter at the demilitarized zone. As for Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, it's speculated that his counterpart in the talks will be North Korea's Foreign Minister Lee Yong-ho. Kim ji Arirang News. Now, it's only been three days since that third North Korea-U.S. summit, but Pyongyang is condemning Washington for being what it calls hell-bent on sanctions. North Korea is angry that the U.S. sent letters to the U.N. Security Council calling on member states to ramp up pressure on the North. Oh jong yi with more. In response to U.S. efforts to turn the screw on North Korea at the U.N., the North says the U.S. is becoming more aggressive in its hostility toward the regime. Last month, the U.S. and 23 other countries sent a letter to the U.N. Security Council's North Korea Sanctions Committee calling for urgent actions to deal with the North importing far more refined petroleum than the annual cap of 500,000 barrels. The U.S. wanted the committee to demand an immediate halt in petroleum deliveries to the North, but China and Russia blocked the move. According to North Korea's U.N. mission, the U.S., France, Germany and Britain sent a letter to all U.N. member states. The letter urged them to repatriate North Korean workers abroad to ramp up sanctions pressure. The North noted how the letter was sent on June 29th, the exact day when President Trump proposed to North Korea's Kim Jong-un that they meet for a handshake at the inter-Korean border. Pyongyang's U.N. mission issued a press statement. It said even though the U.S. says it wants dialogue, these actions really show Washington is becoming more and more, quote, hell-bent on hostile acts against North Korea. It added the North is not desperate to have sanctions lifted. The North also called on U.N. member states to be wary of Washington's, quote, deliberate attempts to undermine peace on the Korean peninsula. On June 30th, Trump met with Kim Jong-un at the inter-Korean truce village of Panmunjom and announced afterwards that the two agreed to start working-level talks this month on denuclearization. Trump added that sanctions will remain, but it looks forward to lifting them when the North makes progress. Oh jong Arirang News. Alec Sigley, an Australian student studying at Kim Il-sung University in North Korea, has been released from detention in the North and is now in China. Sigley was spotted arriving in Beijing on Thursday, where he told reporters that he's doing very well. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison, meanwhile, expressed his gratitude to Sweden for its help. Canberra does not have an embassy in Pyongyang, so it asked Stockholm for help with Swedish envoys meeting with North Korean Foreign Minister Lee Yong-ho on Wednesday. Sigley has been pursuing a master's degree at Kim Il-sung University since last year, but had been out of contact since late May. 
South Korea's main opposition, Liberty Korea Party, has slammed the Moon administration, accusing it of causing concern and fear. In a policy speech on Thursday, floor leader Na kyung won said the government is losing ground both economically and diplomatically. She added the government is only interested in digging up dirt on previous conservative administrations, saying it instead needs to start listening to the opposition to solve problems, including Japan's latest trade measures against South Korea. As for the recent DMZ meeting between the leaders of the two Koreas and the US, she said North Korea still hasn't give up, given up its nuclear weapons, so nothing has changed. But she called for the administration to actively try to set up regular reunions for separated families and to enable them to write to each other. Now also apologized to the people for the long standstill at the National Assembly, vowing to make up for it by carrying out reforms in the political and judiciary sectors in a way that is fair. The South Korean government held a meeting with local business leaders to outline its major economic policies for the second half of this year. The main focus was on Korea's maximum working hours and the minimum wage. Our Seo Eun Kyung has the details. South Korean Finance Minister Hong nam Gyu told Korean business leaders on Thursday that the government will come up with measures to successfully implement 52-hour maximum work weeks and higher minimum wage levels. Hong added that the government would strengthen its effort to reflect the opinions of local businesses who have been concerned about the new work hours and wages. He also said the government would set next year's minimum wage at a reasonable and acceptable level. The 52-hour maximum work week system was initially adopted in July 2018 to promote better work-life balance among Korean workers. The new limit was far lower than the previous ceiling of 68 hours. For now, the system applies to businesses with more than 300 employees, but it will also be required for small and mid-sized companies with 50 to 299 employees starting in January next year. Meanwhile, the country's minimum wage has soared 29 percent over the past two years, from roughly 5.5 U.S. dollars per hour to 7.1 dollars. They're having concerns among small businesses that the wage hike could add significantly to their labor cost burden. A survey conducted by the Korea Federal of SMEs in May showed that 69 percent of local firms were in favor of freezing in the minimum wage for next year. Minister Hong also added that the government would ease regulations on small businesses and provide them with various tax benefits. Seung Kyung, Arirang News. South Korea's current account was back in the black in May, the month before saw the country's first deficit in seven years. Our Kim Dami has the details. South Korea's current account surplus amounted to 4.95 billion U.S. dollars in May. That's a turnaround from the $660 million deficit posted the month before amid sluggish exports. The BOK attributed the turnaround to a smaller services account deficit and the absence of the seasonal surge in dividend payouts that affected April's figures. It's not all good news, though, as the surplus for May is just 41 percent of what it had been 12 months earlier. In addition, despite the turnaround from April, the goods account surplus in May hit its lowest in five years at $5.4 billion. The country's bread and butter semiconductor exports dropped 30 percent on year in May. That's the biggest drop since March 2009, 10 years ago. Imports decreased slightly by 1 percent during the same period due to weak energy prices as well as less machinery imports. The services account deficit narrowed the most since 2017 thanks to more Chinese visitors to the country and fewer Koreans traveling overseas. The current account surplus from January to May this year totaled $15.5 billion far below the central bank's goal of $25 billion. Kim Dami, Arirang News. Korea's content industry has seen a rapid growth in exports thanks to the new wave of Korean culture that's gaining popularity around the world. Our Lee min Sun has the details. Korea's content industry has seen exports boom in recent years thanks to the growing popularity of Korean culture around the world. 
According to the data released on Thursday by the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism, Korea exported 8.8 billion U.S. dollars of contents in 2017. The total amount of exports has been growing steadily since 2013 and saw an almost 50 percent jump in 2017 from the previous year. By sector, the gaming industry recorded the highest exports with $5.9 billion, followed by characters, knowledge and information, and music. The content industry also saw an increase in domestic sales. Total sales were $96.6 billion, a 6.7 percent increase from the year before. Domestic sales in 2017 increased in every sector except publications and animations. The gaming industry stood out domestically with its sales increasing by 20 percent. Domestic sales volume was the largest in the publishing industry, followed by broadcasting, advertising and knowledge and information. The ministry conducted its survey on businesses from nine content industries and combined the results with two additional surveys conducted by the movie and broadcasting industries. Lee min Sun, Arirang News. Just about one week to go until the 18th FINA World Swimming Championships kick off in Korea's southwestern city of Gwangju. Thousands of participants across the globe will converge in the city for the sporting event. And our Kan hyung gives us a preview of what we can expect to see. Under the slogan, Dive into Peace, the world's biggest biannual swimming competition will kick off on Friday, July 12th, in the city of Gwangju, some 300 kilometers south of Seoul. The 18th FINA World Championships will see a record number of participating athletes and countries, with some 3,000 swimmers and divers coming to Gwangju from almost 200 countries. Over the course of 17 days, the athletes will compete in swimming, diving, high diving, artistic swimming, open water swimming, and water polo at five different venues, four in Gwangju and one in Yeosu. Concerning North Korea's participation, there has been no official response from Pyongyang, despite the organizing committee and Gwangju citizens calling for its participation. The committee says it's going to wait for North Korean athletes to show up until the very last minute before the opening ceremony next Friday. According to the committee, even if North Korea ends up taking part in the 11th hour, it shouldn't be disruptive as North Korea usually competes in diving and artistic swimming, both of which aren't schedule sensitive. Some 15,000 participants, including swimmers, coaching staff, media personnel, volunteers and organizers, will be able to enjoy various events and cultural performances the city of Gwangju has prepared on the sidelines of the swimming competition. According to the organizers, a market street will be operated at Nambu University, the main venue of the FINA championships from opening day, featuring many different performances and also food trucks. Kan Young-woo, Arirang News. President Moon Jae-in has chosen Jung Goo Chol to take over as the new presidential secretary for public relations planning. Chung had served as the presidential secretary for the domestic press under former President No Mu Hyun. He replaces Yu Min Young. Moon also chose businessman Kang Jong Su as the new presidential secretary for digital communication. Global tech firms are looking to move some of their production lines out of China amid concerns over the U.S.-China trade conflict. The Nikkei Asian Review reports that HP and Dell are planning to shift up to 30 percent of their laptop production out of China to several Southeast Asian nations. Microsoft, Google and Amazon are also looking at moving production to East Asia. One person has died after a series of volcanic eruptions rocked the Italian island of Stromboli. The victim was thought to have been killed by falling rocks while hiking towards the volcano summit on Wednesday. The eruptions forced many tourists to jump into the sea and several of them are reportedly missing. Firefighters are tackling multiple blazes across the island caused by lava streams. The Seoul Sevens International Rugby Festival will kick off at Bokdong Stadium this weekend. Around 240 participants from six countries will take part and the public can attend the games for free. The top teams in each division will win around 8,500 US dollars. That has been your three minute news flash.
Heat wave alerts have been issued across the country, and for some areas, the advisories have been upgraded into warnings. Let's get more on the weather from our Michelle Park at the Weather Center. Michelle. The Meteorological Agency has announced heat wave advisories for more areas as of 4 p.m. this afternoon. And with the heat expected to intensify further, warnings have now been issued in Seoul, Gyeonggi-do and also Gangwon-do regions, taking effect from tomorrow morning. Now, this will be Seoul's first heat wave warning of the season. Now, due to the high pressure front, Friday will be sunny in the northern provinces, whereas the southern regions and Jeju will be blanketed with clouds. And meanwhile, Beijing and Tokyo will get some rain. Now, let's take a look at our readings in detail. The morning temperatures are similar to how they've been recently, with Seoul and most parts of the country beginning between 19 to 22 degrees Celsius. And to the afternoon, the heat wave will make the high soar into the 30s, soar topping out to 33 degrees Celsius tomorrow. The monsoon front is now far away south from the peninsula and is expected to stay that way until later next week. Until then, we'll have to bear the sizzling hot weather. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. That will wrap it up for this edition of Adirang News. Thank you as always for watching. News in Depth is next.